Hi, everyone. Thanks for bearing with us on those technical difficulties. Thanks for joining Albany's GC Roundtable on the evolving role of general counsels in promoting justice and de and I in the workplace. I'm Shyla Dewan, a partner at King & Spaulding, and I'll be the moderator today. Albany is certified by the New York State CLE Board as an accredited provider. This program has been provided and approved in accordance with the requirements of the CLE Board for a maximum of 1.5 credit hours for the law practice management requirement for both transitional and non-transitional New York attorneys. I'll provide two codes during the panel today. For the folks at home, you can always fill in the codes. And for the folks who are in person, uh, there are sign-in sheets there with you in the room. And without further ado, let's meet our amazing panel of general counsels who are so nice to be with us today. Anne Lee Benedict, general counsel and secretary at Thomas James Holmes. Hannah Kim, Chief Legal Officer, Chief Compliance Officer, and Corporate Secretary at Neiman Marcus Group. Tracy Lesitar Smith, General Counsel, SVP at NASCAR. Nishat Router, General Counsel at TED Conferences. Michael Tang, Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary at Agilent Technologies. And Henry Wang, Executive Vice President and General Counsel at Herbalife Nutrition. Uh, to get us started, we're going to learn a little bit more about the path each of you took to becoming a GC and the advice you have for our audience in becoming a GC. But first, uh, because you're a very impressive <laughs> panel, we wanted to break the ice a little bit. Why don't you tell us uh, your most frivolous or coveted COVID purchase? And I'm going to start with, uh, with Michael, because he's first on my Hollywood Square screen. Oh, well, thank you. And, and you can use Mike. Uh... Michael feels very formal. Uh, so <laughs> I and my wife, we were one of the ones that gave in and we got a Peloton tread uh, as opposed to the bike. Uh, so I have showed up at meetings with my team post-workout, uh, probably not exhibiting some of the executive presence I've been coached to have, but it's been really good. Um, that and I've actually decreased my drinking. So I have managed <laughs> to not um, gain as much weight as I thought I would during this time. That is, that is very impressive. I feel like that's, there's nothing embarrassing about that COVID purchase, Mike. <laughs> Henry, how, how about you? Tell us your, uh, you know, maybe frivolous, maybe coveted and, and fantastic purchase like Mike. Yeah, first, first and foremost, um, thank you for having us. Um, love the topic, love the agenda. Um, not so sure if it's frivolous, definitely questionable. Um, I recently purchased a high-end mountain bike and it's one of my new babies. And, and the reason why it's um, a questionable purchase because earlier this year, I went on a mountain bike ride and um, su suffered a, an accident, had a, a level two concussion. Wow. Um, and not, it's the worst hangover experience ever. Um, don't recommend it. Um, but yet I'm back in the saddle with a new bike and uh, it's my new baby. So highly questionable judgment, um, but I'm looking forward to, uh, to riding it. Well, I'm getting concerned that everyone I ask this question to is also going to be an athlete and can keep up this trend. So, Anne, you're next up. Uh, tell us if you purchased, you know, I don't know, a treadmill also <laughs> to keep this trend going. I, I thought about uh, purchasing a Peloton and then realized I really wasn't going to use it. So I didn't get it. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't want to kid myself. Um, but I would say the probably the most useful purchase that we made during um, all of this would be the ping pong table that we got for our basement. Um, I've got a little one and, you know, you have to find ways to entertain them when they're uh, stuck at home with you. So I would say that's our, our best one. Oh, that's a fun one. Tracy, how about you? Well, first of all, thanks so much for, for having me, everyone. What, what a distinguished panel to be a part of. Um, we uh, we went ahead and we bought a Peloton and a house, and then we were all out of significant decision-making power at that point. We were all out. So everything else that I bought that I would call frivolous or coveted probably came from Hannah's company. So thank you, Hannah. Well, I can't wait to see what Hannah... <laughs> so let's go to Hannah next, because I have to know, Hannah, you who are work at this company that is supplying all of these dreams for our other panelists. Um, what what was your frivolous COVID purchase? Well, I think I've, I, I've got two, one for Anna and one for Tracy. Um, for Ann, I have three kids under the age of 10. And so we got a bouncy house that we put up in our basement. 
And so that has been <laughs> what we needed to get um, a lot of energy out of our kids during the pandemic. And then for Tracy, you know, I think it must have been month three of the lockdown. And so I bought a pair of um, heels that are covered in glitter. I have not worn them yet, but I needed something to put as a carrot for me that life would return to normal at some point. So the glitter heels are still sitting in my closet, but I hope to put them on someday. <laughs> Uh, Nisha, last but not least. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so we actually took a trip. Uh, we usually go overseas. My husband is Dutch, so we usually go that way. But because of COVID, we decided to go the opposite direction and we went to California to take my 17 year old and 20 year old to finally see Disneyland and Universal. So it was actually a lot of fun and it was completely we didn't even look at prices of hotels or where we're staying or the rent a car. We just went and just had a really decent time uh, there. So that would be our buy. We didn't get to keep much except the the uh, what was it the you know the the laser the the thing the Star Wars thing. <laughs> Which my son, yeah, yes, he got to customize his uh, laser thing, so that was fun. But uh, that would that would be the buy the experience that we had. Awesome. So, Anne, let's talk. Let's talk more about the path each of you took. Anne, what drew you to this job? Uh, yeah. So, I um, I moved uh, in house. Um, I had been in private practice for many years. I was a capital markets and M and A uh, lawyer. Um, at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. And so my first in-house role um, was to uh, be a GC for a building materials company, which was highly acquisitive um, and was pre-IPO at the time. So just a really terrific opportunity for me to move from um, you know, private practice um, to a public company. Um, earlier this year, I moved to this role, which is at uh, Thomas James Homes. We are a single lot home builder. Um, and so, you know, it's basically tear down housing, uh, but we do it at scale. So like a production builder, um, so hundreds of houses, not just, you know, onesie twosies, um, you know, but, you know, really in established neighborhoods. And to do that efficiently, um, the company has developed a technology platform because it's really a logistics heavy business for anybody who has been involved in having a home built. Um, and, you know, it's, so it's really this logistics platform that's the backbone for, um, for this business. And really what drew me to this company is that, you know, these folks at Thomas James saw, you know, my founder's name is uh, Tommy, um, you know, saw a gap in, in, in the market um, and really set out to fix that gap and fix that problem and provide, you know, access to a product um, that otherwise is very difficult to, to have. And I just thought that was so compelling um, and wanted to come and be a part of it. Um, plus, I really love real estate. Uh, I also, I guess I, one of my indulgences, I guess, was I did buy a house over COVID as well. Uh, so it's really nice to have a chance to, you know, marry my Redfin search obsession uh, <laughs> with my actual work. So to be able to bring your personal interests and your work together um, is really a, a, a fantastic uh, opportunity. Thank you. Hannah, can you tell us what drew you to the job? You know, I... Um... I went in-house kind of early on in my career. This is pre-financial crisis. And once I got a taste of it and I started out at Lowe's, um, I, I, I knew that I could never go back to law firm life. I mean, I think my day-to-day -day is probably, you know, a part managing, a part practicing law, and a part kind of just being a business partner. And honestly, you know, thinking back on most of my days, I think probably pr the practicing law portion is less than... 10% or 20% on most days. A lot of it's really just being a business partner with your peers and that, you know, coming together and solving problems that has just been such a, the, the really the most engaging part of my day to day. And I mean, I don't know if I ever really sought out to be a GC. That's kind of how things have ended, but the, the in-house kind of camaraderie and the really understanding the business and finding solutions in a practical way that that has kind of been the driving force that's landed me where I am now. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, a slightly different question. Can you tell us about a, a very interesting path you took to get to the position of general counsel at NASCAR? Sure, yeah. You know, I, I don't think that I ever really thought that I would be in sports necessarily. Um, I, I started out as a labor and employment litigator 
And uh, I'd been at that point a martial artist for, for a number of years. And uh, a colleague of mine at the firm that I started with where I was doing litigation, he and I realized we, we were both training at the same MMA gym in Sacramento. Um, and so we're both martial artists uh, in some way, shape and form. And so we, uh, we were casual fans of MMA. Uh, there were a lot of lawsuits going on in the MMA industry. And by the way, for everybody's MMA is mixed martial arts. Um, and so we, we identified that there was sort of a gap, a content gap that we might be able to fill and use as a business development opportunity. And so we did. So uh, while working our day jobs, we moonlit as uh, writers of sort of fan-friendly legal analysis articles for um, what at the time was the primary supplier of content, MMA content to ESPN.com. So through that, we ended up developing this kind of kooky um, and in some ways out of place, in, in some ways really right on time, uh, cache of MMA clients that we brought into the firm. And so we went ahead and we, um, we, we brought in several. One of them was Bellator MMA. Uh, they decided that uh, at some point I had a good enough relationship with them where they decided they needed a full-time GC. I decided that I uh, was not probably going to go back to the billable hour. Thank you, Hannah. And, uh, and, and so it was, it was a match. And so I was in the fight industry for 10 years. Uh, and the fight industry certainly witnessed uh, a lot of the great events in my life, getting married, having two children uh, and, and moving, et cetera. And so um, a couple of years ago, I got a call from NASCAR and uh, their general counsel was departing. Um, she had just decided that, that she wanted to try something new. And so she's actually over at U.S. Soccer now. And I had the great fortune of being part of a process that's that's very rare where your predecessor gets to help in hand selecting their successor. Um, and so obviously it wasn't just her decision really, um, you know, the family had to be involved, all the senior leadership had to be involved, but um, it was it was a match. And so I picked up, the family picked up, we moved from Los Angeles um, where I was working for Bellator and Viacom, which has owned Bellator as long as I've worked for them, as I worked for them. And we moved to Daytona Beach, Florida, which is where I am now, which is, you know, it's, it's 83 out right now. So it's, it's not really fall here. We have our fall though. We have our fall in January. That's when we have our fall. So. Well, I think I'm, I'm the only one in New York, so I'm desperately jealous of <laughs> Um, so, uh, Nishat, why don't you tell us also the path you took to get to the position of general counsel? Uh, yeah, sure. So it was kind of a matter of having, I don't know, a synergy of many events happening at the same time. So I had worked in as corporate counsel as associate GC at CA Technologies for about 10 years. And prior to that, I was in various um, financial and financial services companies before that. And at CA, um, after going there and, and being there for such a long time, um, one of the things that used to brand me within the company, because we had 165 lawyers and we had a lot of different projects, so I was always the rebel of the legal department because I like to actually really fix the issue um, and not have a Band-Aid approach and really identify the real reasons behind it and be really customer savvy and um, and, uh, you know, privacy policies to be really clear with the customers, revamp our uh, contracts and everything and had a whole global change of how we approach our agreements because we used to be very heavy handed and we made that really customer savvy and very mutually fair. At the same time, I was doing a lot of community events, including a TEDx event at our at, at my town, which I had organized and been the organizer for and it took about six months of my life. A year later, um, after CA kind of changed and went in different directions and got sold to Broadcom and a few other things, um, I was working and I had this uh, uh, this role that I was offered a WGC um, uh, position in New Jersey where I was going to leave New York and finally have some time for my teenage kids because I really needed to spend time with them. And I had figured, great, I'm done with the New York thing. I'm done with the commuting. I'm going to spend time 
And I talked to my girlfriend at the time who was the head of video at TED. And I told her about this new job and how excited I was to kind of bring the volume down after years and years of being always on, you know, 150%. And she's like, you know, it's so funny because we actually don't have anyone at TED who's legal. And we use outside firms, but there's a lot of mismatching. So because I had been a TEDx organizer and known so much about TED, you know, part of me was like, what? Are you kidding me? Like, TED needs someone? But the other half of me had just made a commitment to my family that I was not going to be in the city. I was not going to be insanely busy around the clock and traveling everywhere, worldwide, whatever. So it was a really tough decision. And so what I ended up doing is I was super honest and open. Um, and I told my friend, I said, look, I could not really accept this job because I already have this other job that I got offered. I, I wanted to stay home. I didn't want to go to the city, all these other things. And I wouldn't want to just be a contract lawyer because I've done that. I would want it to be a really strategic advisor to the business from that perspective, because that's what's important, right? And I just kind of laid it out there. And the following morning, I got a note from Chris Anderson directly saying, how about we have a conversation? Um, so again, I was super excited on the one hand, but on the other hand, I was trying to be very calm. And we just had a really open conversation about what Ted was looking for. And I talked to him about really the legal angle and how I felt Ted's voice could be represented from a legal perspective in our agreements and the way we connect with people and the way we collaborate with others and the way we draft our agreements. It can actually be meaningful and really reflect the Ted voice. And that's what I was excited about. I said, but I'm really sorry because I already accepted this other position. So I have to know really quickly or maybe six months down the line. So then he um, wrote me back and I, and I met a bunch of people and I think it was Monday, literally two days later that I got the offer and I started at TED as GC and that was six years ago. So we we're developing strategy, vision, mission, and it's always been such a joy, but the one hard part about it, I would just say, is when it does really connect your personal life, your community life and your work life together, it feels like you're never working, but you're always working. <laughs> so that's the one thing I never would have anticipated about work. It's really holistically, uh, it hits all the, all the marks. So that's how I would uh, say I came over to TED. Thank you. So Mike, I hear you are the king of career advice. So- Unsolicited now, career advice. Well, well there it's now solicited. Uh, what are the most common roadblocks you've seen on the path to GC, and do you have any advice for navigating those roadblocks for our audience? Yeah, and so I'll speak as the perspective of someone that grew up in my legal department. I left my law, uh, the second law firm I was at in the middle of my fifth year. I, I hated the law firm. I was a bad law firm attorney. And um, so I spent the uh, last 15 years at Agilent. I actually left the legal department, joined Corp Dev, came back. Uh, I'm an M&A background like Anne. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about this question and I think there are like three things for me. One is opportunity. Um, anyone who doesn't think luck plays a certain amount of, of a role in your career, you're just fooling yourself. Now, the question is when that luck happens and you're in that position, what do you do? What have you done to get that, to take advantage of the luck? So that's one. I think two, perception. Um, Agilent's a relatively large company. Uh, it's a relatively large legal department. So people are fairly siloed. If you're an internal candidate, you're never going to check all the boxes. It's just impossible. Like, you know, you look at the job descriptions that people post for GCs. I mean, they want like some magical person. I was at M&A corporate person. I, what did I know about IT, employment law? They wanted someone that managed a big team. I managed a team of four. <laughs> um, so, I mean, so you have to be able to show through what you've done, how you at least fulfill some of those boxes, you have to have built a reputation that you're beyond what you look like in paper. And then the last thing um, I think it's, who's your sponsor? Who's advocating for you? When you get that job and you're not in the room, who on CEO staff or the CEO or otherwise is saying, you know, that Mike Tang, he might be too junior. He might only be an M&A attorney, but I've seen him do this. And this shows why he can flex from this role to this role. Uh, but there's no magic formula. I, I got lucky and I took advantage of it. 
That's that's really insightful advice. Henry, I have the same question for you. And I guess question one is, you know, do you agree with Mike's assessment? And then to the extent you've experienced this, what roadblocks have you seen uh, in your peers? And how do you advise, uh, how do you give advice for navigating those roadblocks? Yeah, so, so as a former litigator, um, I've been taught that if you agree with the judge, you just say, I agree, Your Honor. Um, so Mike, not that you're you're the judge here, but I agree with everything you just said. There's definitely luck. Uh, there's definitely the need for sponsorship. Um, you got to look for opportunities. Um, and, and I'm probably an anomaly because this is my first um, in-house job. Um, I was, uh, I consider myself sort of a, a battlefield commissioned officer. Uh, I joined the company about eight years ago as an associate general counsel. And for those of you who may be familiar with our company recent history, been through a lot of, um, let's just say it was a journey. Um, and, um, and when the opportunity, as Mike said, came up uh, for a general counsel position, uh, the company did do um, a nationwide search. And, uh, and Mike's right, you, know, you need to have your internal sponsor, right? Unfortunately, I've been through the battles, been in the foxholes with the CFO, with you know, all the EVPs, so they knew I was a known quantity. So that helped a lot. Um, but in terms of, I think, just anecdotally, just talking to our peers about their experiences in landing their general counsel position, I, I think there are two that comes to mind. The first one I think is a little challenging, as Mike said, because as a general counsel, you have to know everything, but you're not an expert in anything, right? Um, in fact, one of our uh, lunch and learns one of my um, team members uh, was talking about um, the duties of, of, of an in-house lawyer. And he jokingly um, said, which I completely endorsed, that as a lawyer, you, can't, you should be practicing in the area that you actually have knowledge about, right? So if you don't have the expertise, you can't be giving out advice uh, because otherwise you're essentially committing malpractice. And he immediately turned to me and said, so as a general counsel, Henry can give no advice because he knows nothing and he's just a generalist. Um, but, but all kidding aside, I think, um, I think it is important to be a generalist. Um, so I came from a general litigation background. So I had the opportunity to actually handle a lot of different cases. Now I may not have been an uh, M&A lawyer, but I've handled M&A cases from a litigation perspective employment perspective, IP case. So I think that really helped me to be um, a malpracticing lawyer who shouldn't be giving any, any advice as a general counsel. Um, so that's one. I think expanding your experience, even though it's hard to you know, be the master of anything, expanding your experience would be helpful. And the second roadblock that I've, I've, I've heard, I've seen, um, is the need to fit in a particular culture. You know, especially at some of the bigger companies, you hear, you know, the C-suite inviting the candidates out to dinner, inviting their significant others, you know, for a meet and greet. Um, so I think that, you know, can be a benefit uh, or it can be a roadblock. And I, again, going back to what Mike said, if you have somebody on the inside who can sponsor you, I think that's tremendously helpful. Thanks, Henry. I want to quickly give our first CLE code. There'll be two. The first one is outside 1080. Again, that's outside 1080. I'm also putting it in the chat for folks who are on Zoom. I have one more question. It's open to everyone because I think you know a lot of our attendees are very interested in your advice on this issue. What key advice would you offer to our audience for becoming a GC or just more generally, you know, being successful in an in-house legal department? I'll go. Um, I, I, you know, I, what I tell my team always is uh, learn the business, which is easier said than done. I mean, I mean, we're a life sciences and diagnostics company. And so a lot of lawyers don't come from that background. And then two is put yourself out there. Um, like, don't, you don't just give opinions. You give a recommendation, right? You have to put your neck on the line. Um, it doesn't matter if you're right. Right means nothing. If you can't communicate, if you can't influence, if you can't bring people along, like no one likes to know it all. You make them take people along with you on the journey. I mean, show that you, you're more than just a lawyer. Tracy, did you want to add something? 
Yeah, I can I can contribute too. Um, you know, I think I think that there's definitely um, there's definitely a lot of of what's already been said that is indispensable advice. You know, I think that you need to if if you're really wanting to go in house, I think there's really there's really kind of five what I would call sort of non-negotiables. There's a lot of things that are nice to have that you develop over time, right? I mean, if you're a lawyer, the first three to four years of your practice is gonna be developing skills, acquiring skills. The second three to four years of your practice are gonna be honing, honing those skills and developing your instincts. And everything after that is about people. Everything after that is about people. Managing up, managing laterally, managing down, Right. But I think as a lawyer, when, when you're trying to forge your path to to be this sort of generalist, you have to look at these these five basic things. Right. One is knowledge of the law. Right. And, and two is communication. Right. Mike just said that communication, integrity, trustworthiness. Right. Good judgment. And then knowing your own limits. These are these are things that understanding your own limits. These are things that I think are really indispensable. And the more that you can carve a path and try to hone those. I think um, you're going to find yourself in a, in a good place, but also, you know, you need to embrace an unexpected path because your path to going in house, your path to getting to GC may not be what you envisioned. It may not be what you think is traditional. Um, and that's okay. There's, there's, you know, a lot of different ways to skin the cat and to get to where you want to go. That's what I'd say. Thank you. I, I want to leave it open to anyone else. Nishad, I see you just came on. Yeah, no, I was I was just going to say one of the things, the toughest things I think that I found in dealing with C-suite issues is dealing with um, kind of the moral compass that you have uh, in guiding you. Because if you don't have a strong sense of why you're doing something, you can land into some difficulty. And that means you know, there's a, I think it's interesting, Tracy, the way you're lining this up, I would say the first five to 10 years, you're learning knowledge. And then you also are finding out what you need to critically analyze as right, wrong, indifferent, or political, or part of the, you know, what you need to do to not step on anyone's toes. There's a lot of politics in house, as much as there is probably in private practice. Um, and I think that's really important to understand and navigate because I think the people that distinguish themselves are the ones who can step out and feel safe and courageous about speaking out what they feel is really true. And if your business partner can trust you, truly trust you, and you build that, that's really so invaluable. Because once you've built that, they want you later on. And I've had that with clients where they're like, I want you to follow me when I get this promotion or I want this, I want that. That's incredibly valuable because then you've really made your brand associated with incredible trust. And I think that's just really important to understand where you stand. But that also means you can't always lean on whatever the company wants or what your boss wants or what someone else wants, you really have to take a decision that you understand to be true and that you can rely on that deeply and you can step out and take the risk like Michael was talking about. Um, really, really important stuff. But just adding, just wanted to add that. Yeah, if I could just reinforce that um, and just, I think Mike, um, Tracy and Nisha, you all covered it. I just want to emphasize the importance of the word influence and relationship, right? And trust everything that you all said because corporate life is, is, is very dynamic. Um, again, as a former litigator, life was very simple. I had a judge, I had an opposing counsel, 12 people in the box, I need to persuade. Everybody had a role. Um, in corporate world, it's very, very fluid. Uh, but one thing's for sure, every vertical, whether it's business, manufacturing, human resources, finance, they all have their own interests as well, right? And it's multifaceted. It's always constantly um, moving and, and very fluid. So rather than tackling each and every issue, which would be so exhausted, right? So exhausting. Um, having a good, real trusting relationship and being able to influence your business partners would make everything go a lot smoother. It's just a lot more um, manageable. And, and just for instance, just real time, I just got an email. I, one, of, one of my um, executives just got promoted and HR is coming back with a recommendation of a new salary. And HR, they got to manage their budget, right? They say, hey, it should be X. And I said, no, it should be X plus Y, right? And 
listening to my other colleagues who may not have such a good relationship with HR, they struggle with those type of conversation. And fortunately for me, and I, I was taught early to make sure you view HR as your mother and your CFO as your father, the response came back in 24 hours, no problem, Henry, you're gonna get the addition, not me, but my team will get the additional bump. So if there's one advice, if I were to simplify relationship influence, if there are two most important department relationship that you need to maintain, one is HR and the other one's finance because they hold the purse and HR holds all the information. Did you just say brother and sister instead? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? You're right, brother, sister. Those, those were the okay. nice words that they said. Yeah, I was a little bit bothered by it too. Like father, mother. That's a little right. bit. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right. right. I okay. get your point. Yeah. yeah. Well, one big happy family. <laughs> Anne or Hannah, do, do either of you want to add anything in terms of advice? Because I think this is so helpful for the audience. You all have such unique viewpoints. You know, I, I always feel like um, all the advice that my parents gave me as a kid, it's, it was always to do the opposite works in the corporate environment. So, you know, it's keep your head down, work, and magically you'll get a promotion. And that does not happen. <laughs> and so I think, you know, looking back to things that I wish that I had done is really um, spent less time focusing on the, the substance of whatever I was learning, you know, the particular area of the law, but spent more time kind of uh, with partners as they were doing conducting business development. And then when I went in house, I wish that I had probably um, shaved several years off and spent more time with the business clients so they could teach me the intricacies of their particular area. But that, um, you know, I think people would have called them soft skills, but I really just think that they're critical business skills that you have to have. Having that unlock earlier on is something that I um, wish that I had had that now I think is as all of us spend time with um, other attorneys who are coming through with their careers. I think it's something that we probably all impress upon them as things that they need to learn um, earlier than definitely I did. Thanks, Hannah. Anne, did you want to add anything? Yes, sure. I think um, what, what everybody has said has been, you know, hugely valuable and, and totally, you know, spot on. I think, you know, um, really a lot of it is, you know, opportunity and how and thinking flexibly about how to, um, you know, create more opportunities for, you know, yourself going forward and being in a position to really take advantage of those when they, you know, when they do come as opposed to, and I think, you know, what you've heard from this panel, this is why I always love these panels is, you know, there's lots of different ways to get there as Tracy noted, right? But what, you know, what you're hearing, I think is, you know, it's relationships, it's communication, it's developing very early on, you know, right? This is really important to be somebody who hears what people are saying um, and really, you know, helps to be moving things forward and, you know, and trying to help, you know, really come to good solutions and, and really, this role is really about being a bridge in a lot of ways um, and practicing that as early as possible and often, um, I think will you know, be very beneficial for anyone who wants to do that. That's, and that's a great segue into the, the meat of our panel, sort of what is the general counsel's role in building a bridge, as you say, uh, in terms of DE&I and justice in the workplace? Obviously with the Black Lives Matter movement and recently with the increase in Asian Pacific American hate, hate crimes throughout the US, we've really seen a resurgence in addressing this issue from various general counsels nationwide. Uh, and we're really interested in hearing, you know, what do you view the general counsel's role as in, in advancing justice and advancing diversity in the legal industry generally, but also, you know, in, in your respective uh, in-house legal departments and your companies. So I'm gonna start with Hannah. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, we're, we're all in kind of a unique position. I think, first of all, I think to influence just the processes within the department. And so it's recruiting and retaining talent and then developing talent within your, your legal department. And then um, separate and aside from that is really, I think all of us have the influence of the money that we spend. So we, I know a lot of us on this panel um, today, we also influence a lot of, um, 
processes with all the outside counsel that we speak to. And so whether that's, you know, a certain percentage of billings from women or attorneys of color, um, veterans, LGBTQ plus status. So I think we've got a, a, a lot of kind of tools to also influence just diversity in the legal profession just generally. And if we think about ourselves and the role of the leaders of our company, I think um, we also have a, a huge, you know, play a huge role in influencing how our own employers, how our companies attract DEI and B issues. Um, so I, I think, you know, over the last several years, I've, I've spent definitely a lot of time um, with other GCs just to, just to get their thoughts on how they're kind of playing that role, both within the department their company, um, the industry, and also with outside counsel. And it's been a really, it's been a great network. I think of all the things that um, a lot of general counsels and companies have done over the last several years has been amazing. It's not um, being reflected in the numbers quite yet. And, and I think that's just a fact, but I, I am hopeful that as we all work on various things, whether it's you know the pressure that we put on our law firms, kind of the pressure that we put on our recruiting departments and HR departments at our company. Um, and also kind of just us as a leader, what are we holding ourselves accountable to? Uh, you, you know, uh, a lot of us have talked with our law firms about kind of their diversity metrics. One, one thing has, that has been important to me is I, I don't feel comfortable with asking a law firm to hit a certain metric if I don't hit it myself. And so, um, you know, I have actually been, and I know that Tracy, you have some phenomenal statistics <laughs> within your own legal department. One thing that has been important to me is also to be vulnerable to say, this is where I am. Um, can we, are there opportunities for partnership where we can help each other, which is, you know, I know for fifth or sixth years, that's a lot of time that tipping point where you've got retention issues. Is there something that we can do to help um, the law firms with retaining that great talent and then separately is there something that we can do on our side where we can train and develop the talent that we've got on the corporate side but it's been um, you know a huge awakening definitely but I think for all of us we are in unique positions where we can influence kind of DE&I efforts across a lot of dis different spheres. Thank you. And the same question, you know, at a, at a high level, what do you think GCs can do to advance these initiatives in the legal industry? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I totally echo everything Hannah um, just described. You know, this is, this is, you know, I think there are, we know, a, you know, everyone on this panel, so many folks that we know, you know, we, we really take this responsibility, right, that we have in this position. And you know, the knowledge that we, you know, we are in a position to, you know, in, in whatever shape we can, um, you know, have an influence. And that's, that's, an, that's enough, that's a responsibility that we bear. You know, I think particularly being the lawyers in the business, right, we come from the lens of, you know, having a responsibility to, you know, to really be fighting for justice, right, and, and, and we're grounded in the law. Um, and, you know, and we sit at this intersection, just like we were talking about in our business, um, and that intersection of where everything comes together, but there is not a corner of a company that, you know, you don't touch from the legal department. Um, and that is a very natural, you know, place, right, for, you know, really bringing DE&I issues together, right, and really addressing those and, and you know, through the organization, um, you know, and with our partners in, you know, at our, at our law firms and, and through the legal community, as Hannah, you know, was talking about, um, you know, and like, and frankly, some of it is really, you know, sometimes I can't tell you the number of times I've had a conversation with someone and said, you know, I'd really love to see, you know, some more diversity, you know, in whatever area. And this like light bulb goes, goes off because the person you're speaking with just hasn't had an, you know, a, an opportunity to, to really think about about that it just it just hasn't come up for them and it's not like they were trying to to you know not it's just like they really weren't conscious about it and being in a position where you know you can have that conversation um and really put it you know in the front of their their mind um you know I have found is you know is a pretty low-key way <laughs> to help more people you know really be you know thinking um, hard about you know really making improvements at where they can 
I'm, I'm so glad you said that. And I'm so glad you weren't judgmental about it too, because I, I honestly, like a couple of weeks ago, I had the exact, this exact scenario happen to me. Whereas I think, you know, as a diverse partner, you think you're doing the most, you know, you're really looking and thinking about elevating people and what your team looks like. And, you know, but when you have like a rush deadline, you just throw whatever person you can find on it and you're maybe not thinking about it. And when the client comes back and says, hey, did you think about this? You know, you have to pause and say, you know, I, I, I thought the rush was more important than this. And if the client comes back and says, rush is not more important than that, then, you know, it reinforces that value for us as outside counsel. So it's a really great thing that you do that. Um, so we've touched on this a little bit with all of these answers now. There are a number of diversity initiatives directed both at in-house and, you know, outside counsel. In your experience, this will be directed at Nisha and Tracy. In your experience, what policies actually work at advancing the ball based on your experiences, both in-house and with your outside counsel? Um, well, it's interesting. I think it's a combination of things. On the one hand, Ted as a company, we're doing a lot of things and putting the work in what DEI really means, which means IDI cultural um, assessments, uh, discussions, meaningful talks about things, looking at a bunch of TED Talks about understanding racial literacy, calling people in, not calling them out, understanding kind of the layers in cultural bias, because all of us come in with it. And the actual idea that one or two things can then resolve it is really a little bit silly. It really takes a lot of work and it's an ongoing, really constant thing. So some of the things that we've done internally, on the one hand, I was part of 240 general counsels who wrote a letter openly to law firms back in 2019, calling out for more diversity and demanding that if the if there's, there's there was an acknowledgement that associates were diverse, but those associates were not being promoted to partner. So that was really one of the core parts of the letter talking about advancement, talking about are they in the leadership positions, not just brought as, you know, um, oh, we have a diverse group. Here is a speaker who seems to be a person of color. Oh, congratulations for having a speaker. Do they get credit for the deal? What exactly are, you know, what are the, what are the components around it? So on one hand, we look at outside counsel and we do have a rigor. I do include it in our outside counsel guidelines. And we ask them on a, on a yearly basis, how are you doing with respect to diversity? What are you doing? Tactics specifically. Um, we also try to have certain ways to vet um, internal resumes. Uh, one of the things we do is, is I, I have a fun way. If I can't pronounce the name, I'm excited and I want to kind of bring up the resumes to a forward spot. If I understand and I see the background and it's a very typical prestigious school, that doesn't necessarily bring them to the top. Um, want to seek kind of some other candidates. And what I find is recruiters often don't push candidates who are diverse because that's not what makes the quickest buck for them. So it's really interesting to ask recruiters who you work with to really vet their candidates fairly and to not block out people who they think are not gonna make the cut. And that's something that's really important to note because right now um, that's some of the practices that we've seen and we've been really strategic in trying to choose very specifically uh, recruiters who look for candidates from historically black colleges and things like that. You know, various things and elements that help look at qualities that are not typical in the vetting of candidates, um, particularly for, for lawyers or otherwise. So those are some of the things that we do internally um, and just have a better mindfulness about what we're doing and how we're doing it uh, to keep it top of mind. I think I think everything that, that Nishat pointed out, I, I, I think really really goes to to how we think about this and 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 how I I personally think about this. You know, I think I think the past 4 to 6 years we've really seen some things that are just so dark. The world has been in such a dark place in so many ways. And I am heartened. I am heartened. I think maybe we should invite ourselves to be heartened by the creativity and and the willingness to to innovate in in how we think about influencing the space of diversity right and and so you know to me i think when it when it comes to ensuring that we have diverse representation and diverse viewpoints there's really the policies that work 
in some ways seem to go to one of three things, right? Hiring diverse people, retaining diverse people and empowering diverse people. And I think there, there are a lot of, of really wonderful other, other kind of footnotes that get dropped in each of those categories. But if we're on our way to parity on this train, these are the three stops we have to make. And, and I think that the sometimes even the empowerment gets overlooked, right? We really have to think about, you can't just put people in, you have to have a pipeline. Yes, you have to make sure that your pipeline is really funneling people who are diverse, who are skilled, who have diverse viewpoints, right? But at the end of the day, to Nishad's point, well, are they getting credit for the deals? Are they sitting at the table? Do they have access to, to the senior leadership? Are they in the senior leadership? What does the senior leadership table look like? And not being afraid to simply say, hey, guys, remember, these are the three stops on the train. So if I look around the room and I say, I, I feel like we're maybe we're not there today, um, just reminding people with good style that these are the three stops we're trying to make on this train. Um, and so we need to be thinking very intentionally about what policies we can implement that that are going to promote each of those things. So that's a, a great segue into the next question. I'll direct this to Mike and Henry. You know, what can the legal industry do to accelerate this process? Because I think everyone agrees the numbers aren't there yet. We certainly have a lot of policies in place with you know scattered adoption nationwide. But what can we do to actually light a fire here? Henry, I went first last time, so I'm going to turn it to you. Uh, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, <laughs> now, like, I, I think um, having these conversations, right, raising the awareness, I think that's the first and foremost thing that we do. And, and sometimes, oftentimes, you see social initiative, political initiatives, they come and go, right? And my, my biggest fear is that this is just going to be another passing moment, and it shouldn't be, right? And, and all of us here, and those of us, um, or those of you in the audience, who are in position of influence, right? Whether it's by title, whether it's by your purse or your wallet, um, I think we need to continue to push the envelope, right? And, and frankly, I, I just wanna say thank you to all the panelists because um, from this discussion, you all just gave me some good ideas in terms of what I can do here in my company, in my department, in terms of advancing this issue, including Nisha, just looking at the names on the resume, you know, I've never even thought about that. And that, that's a great approach. So, uh, but again, just having these, this, this type of dialogue and the raising awareness. So last but not least, I'm just gonna come out and say this, like we all used to be in law firms, right? And law firms are always looking for um, opportunities to engage with in-house attorneys. I think that as general counsel, we have the opportunity to be more engaged as sponsors of conferences such as this, right? You know, I know it's always hard to get money from the finance department um, to, to do marketing in the legal field because what's the return on investment, right? And that's the case that we, can, we have to, to, to present. And if we can continue, not just to attend the conferences, but be sponsored of certain conferences that advance these type of issue, I think that also demonstrates a commitment. And then as a ripple effect, I think law firms will follow suit even more so. Mike? Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to follow up all of, all of these. Uh, so, I mean, it's incredible speakers, incredible ideas. The way I look at it, no matter what your position is, but obviously if you're in the GC, intentionality. Intentionality in what you do. Um, you know, I, when I got this job, I was the only person of color on CEO staff replacing the only person of color. Uh, incredible leader, Mario Huber is now the GC of eBay. Um, so I intentionally knew that this was my role, my obligation to speak about it in the company, speak about it outside. But I think it goes beyond just me. Um, intent, like having good feelings about D&I, &E saying the right things, in the end kind of like means nothing. Like Henry said it, I mean, this is kind of, it, we're in danger of it just going, just being another cycle going away. Like I can say I want to run a marathon. If I don't have a nutrition, nutrition plan, a training program, accountability, metrics, 
then is meaningless. And that's what I think as in-house leaders for the company, companies that talk about DEI, well, okay, then, then put your money where your mouth is. Like people like me should be compensated partially on whether I hit metrics or not, even if I'm not allowed to hire that much, right? How I promote, how I compensate. When we look at talent development, there should be a system, a process. There should be accountability. People's reviews should be on that. When I look at law firms, one of the biggest things I think for in-house leaders is there's no common grading system to say you're a good law firm, you're a bad law firm, right? There, there needs to be a little more structure and system and processes, and we need to push for that or, or else we're all kind of working on our own, trying to figure it out, saying, hey, that was a good idea on this panel. I wish there was a little more uniformity. I mean, that's really interesting. I think we'll talk a little bit more about outside counsel hiring and a lot of the sort of scorecards and metrics that are floating around, but that's a great point. There's really no sort of consistency across the board and how, how those are being measured. Um, I want to hear from all of you on this because you've all built uh, strong, diverse teams. You're obviously very focused on, you know, on hiring within your in-house teams. Um, but I'll start with Tracy, because Tracy got a shout out from Hannah on this panel about how uh, diverse, how, how wonderful her diversity metrics were. So Tracy, tell us what the secret sauce is. What are the processes you have in place to assure, you know, a diverse team? Well, well, um, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. So, so um, I really appreciated the shout out. Um, you know, the legal team uh, is, is one of the most diverse teams in, in the company, in the sport. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been at NASCAR for a little over two years now. And so I, I also had the good fortune of having a predecessor who was also wildly committed to this. Right. And so, and so it's, it's that continuity that really helps. Right. But, it, but I think it really goes back to an aspect of empowerment in the hiring process. Right. And that is that, that our diverse team members are the ones who are, we, I mean, we, we put everybody who is a finalist gets put through, I'd like to say the gauntlet, right? They interview with our team members and our core team members have a voice. And so not only is the candidate really in their interview process, seeing diverse people, right? In, in, and seeing them in positions of empowerment and managerial positions, um, you know, kind of going the other way, those people are really interviewing the candidates and they have a direct voice in what they thought and who would be a good fit and who would be good for the future of the department. And these, these things, it, it's an aspect of empowerment that that I don't think it, I, I don't want to say it gets overlooked. All I will say is that it is critical in our process to, to have those folks, really all of us selecting the people that are getting interviewed, interviewing those people, and then having a, a voice in the decision making, the decisions that actually get made. And that's how we've been able to sustain a high level of diversity. Does anyone else want to, you know, give us a little bit of their recipe about how you've been ensuring diversity in house in your hiring? Just one one quick note that um, I've just recently hired uh, an associate counsel, and he ended up being a white male, which was actually really unique because in our company we don't have a lot of white cisgender male <laughs> in our company. So I was making the diverse uh, hire there, but in any event. I just wanted to say that what's really interesting is um, when you do see resumes and you see background, um, one of the things I think is always important is that diversity means more than just their background, but having people within a company, and this is what we're working on also at TED, to truly feel included. And I think that's the piece of inclusion that often means something more because it's more than just a, a checkbox, but it means feeling welcome, feeling safe, feeling capable of actually contributing to the discussion. And one of the things I often tell my teams is that the more diversity of thought that we have, the better the end 
idea becomes because it's reflective of many different opinions and that's just a better decision. So if I say one way, don't say yes, just because you think I need, you know, I'm the one with the, with the, with the name or the function, but we need to really vet out everything and letting people feel free enough to really counterpoint, I think is so important in, in whatever way that they can. So that's just something I wanted to note that inclusion also means bringing them to the table and giving them an equal voice so yeah i wanted to build that that's an incredible point and build upon that it, you know and there are so many ways that you can do it like are you a leader in that when you're in front of other groups and your team is presenting do you let your team present mm -hmm. or are you that person that just interrupts all the time and say, what they really meant was like that like no team your team is not going to feel empowered you're not going to feel included right um are you are you a leader that knows everybody in your department, small, big, knows what they want, what their ambitions are. My team is like a hundred something, 120 people. I better know everybody. If I don't, I'm a terrible leader. I better know what they want, right? Do I know everybody? No, but if I better know at least 95%. Uh, and then just moving on to more of the, 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 the kind of more back to systems and processes. I mean, I, we, you must have a diverse interview panel. You must have a diverse pool the rec doesn't move forward and you have to be willing to lose it if you don't have it. I ran Corp Dev last year in between leaders. We had a rec, my VP who didn't really know me that well since I was a temporary leader, didn't follow my, my instructions. I was like, you gotta go back to the drawing board. And in between then, CEO and CFO, to Henry's point of the CFO holding the uh, first rigs, took away the rec. And the VP was not happy. I was like, well, listen, either you stand behind what you believe in or you don't. And this is where, what direction I think the department should go in. But it's, you kind of have to have some kind of, someone mentioned moral compass, <laughs> moral compass and, and principles to stand behind. I, I want to move forward a little bit so we stay on, on time because I think these are great answers. We could talk all day about most of these topics. Um, one thing that we've seen a lot happening recently, you know, there the recent results from the Minority Corporate Council Association's Fortune 1000 survey of GCs uh, indicates that in-house diversity is suffering due to COVID, whether that's a lack of experiences or what have you. There's been a lot of recent literature about, you know, caregivers doing a lot of emotional labor during the pandemic within the workplace, or women doing carrying a lot of emotional labor during the workplace, in the workplace during COVID. Um, and of course, you know, so many diverse um, attorneys also doing the emotional labor around Black Lives Matter. Um, as a general question, I'll direct this to Ann and Hannah in the first instance. What have you been doing to retain diverse talent or strengthen teams during this time? And again, I know I'm sort of skipping around in questions so we can move forward. So if other folks wanna chime in on those as well, please feel free. Yeah, I'll start the, um, so, so Neiman's is women founded, women led, um, women make up 60% of the senior leadership team. Our board is, is majority women. And, and so during this period of time, I mean, I'll just start with at a basic, we, we gave everyone kind of carte blanche to, to live their life. So if people had hours where they were, you know, managing three kids on Zoom, we, we will not schedule a meeting during those hours. And I, I think coming out of COVID, that's the, um, those are the practices that I still want to, to keep in place because I, I think we've added this huge human element to working that we didn't have before. I mean, all of us have seen all of our coworkers, kids, we've heard everyone's dogs. We know exactly, you know, more about people's lives than we see their home every day. We, we know more about their kind of their life every day. And I think we've given a significant amount of um, grace to how people work. And that's one piece that I think um, is important in retaining talent, which is, you know, you don't have this really structured day to day. You're a talented individual. You contribute a lot to the company and to the business. We also have to kind of work around your life, too. So those are things that I, I, um, I hope that we still have, you know, in years to come that were huge learnings coming out of this. And um, just about the retention of talent, just broadly, I'll say, you know, we've all, you know, talked about mentorship. We've all had strong mentors. Um, one thing is that I've tried to implement is, especially for a lot of key talent, which is 
when when do you see that flag raise? Are there you know signs, warning signs that you can be attuned to when someone isn't happy that you can address? Because a lot of times, you know, the recruiting part is easy. <laughs> That's definitely the easy. The retention part is far harder. So how do you have the the development? How do you have the discussions? How how do you know? Kind of to Michael's point, how do you know what people want and where you're not meeting their needs? So I think really for um, for a lot of for a lot of talent, just generally, I think just having those pulse checks and knowing what um, they need for their own development, it's it's a critical piece. Well, uh, Anne, did you want to add something? Yeah, no, I think that's you know all of that is absolutely the case, and you know, in this environment, right? I think we, I think a lot of us have heard you know, heard a lot of folks who are speaking about empathy, right? This has been an environment in which all of a sudden we're all in each other's homes. Everyone's working from home all the time and really being mindful of the fact that like this separation between, you know, work and home, um, you know, has, you know, effectively disappeared. Um, you know, and I think, but again, having that voice and also helping colleagues who may not have the perspective that we bring as, you know, as as women, as you know, members of an unrepresented group, um, and you know, helping them to think again, right? Helping them to think about checking in with people on their teams as well, um, and you know, so that you're really just not, you know, influencing right our own departments, but also really through you know through the organization. Again, I can't tell you how many times I've had a conversation with somebody and said, oh, you know, these are the kinds of things that, you know, a lot of folks in the APA community are feeling right now, right? And it's like, oh, I should go check in with so-and-so. You know, they just, it's, you know, you can do that. You can, you can help people really, you know, um, bring awareness for people um, and, you know, and help a lot, a lot more folks. So this is directed to Tracy and Nisha both. In terms of, um, skills development for your in-house legal department during COVID, some folks have said, you know, skills development is harder because we're sort of siloed to your house. Has that been your experience, first of all? And if it has, you know, what have you done proactively to sort of ensure your legal team is still getting the experience it needs to advance? It's, it's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take that first. So one of the things that, um, that I made a commitment to when I landed here um, and I started this job was to enhance internal education, the in-house education. We, you know, we've got 15 different facilities. We have, you know, an entire league, right, along with media rights and, um, you know, and sponsorship, partnership, sales, um, you know, and then, then the actual product competition that goes onto the track. We have a phalanx of outside counsel firms, right? That we that we over time, you know, pay substantial amounts to. And so we leverage those firms. And part of the engagement for us, one of the conditions of our engagement with some of, especially some of the firms that are that are larger, have multiple offices and are and are doing a lot of different types of work for us, is that they come in a minimum of once a year and they come and do um, in-house education for us. Uh, and so, so that's, that's been something that actually we've been able to make happen even more readily because we can now do everything virtually. So we don't even have to have them fly in. We prepare the program. We have an in-house, uh, within the legal department, we actually have a, a subcommittee on CLEs. And it's made up of some more senior attorneys uh, and then some of the most junior attorneys and some of the senior paralegals and they decide what the topics are. And then we decide who we wanna to go to. And I can tell you the answer is always yes. It is never no, it's always yes. Whatever it is that we want them to come in and do, this is an opportunity for them to build relationships directly with not only the most senior attorneys that are managing the work, but also the most junior attorneys that are gonna be the next generation in this pipeline that are getting empowered and gonna be in managerial roles in a couple of years. So it, the answer is always yes. And um, so that, that's, that's one thing that, that we've done that's been helpful during the pandemic and actually um, improved a little during the pandemic because of the virtual world that we are finding ourselves living in. I think I want to join your team, Tracy. So, like, you have so many resources. 
Ted had, I don't know, we had a lot of stuff going on. We're a small business, not for profit, suffering in New York, have huge rents. No, no, you know, the banks and the leases didn't change, right? We had no one in our offices. We had two huge virtual conferences, one that lasted for seven weeks straight. We had COVID-19 issues. So we're, we're talking about massive, in, in, you know, increase of legal sources, legal resources on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll be honest with you, the only thing that I would say that helped us in building these out is creating closer relationships amongst the lawyers because we were all going through so much and having these talks where we would ask, what Marvel movie did you see now, you know, and just being able to just shoot the stuff, which we wouldn't do in person, but somehow on Zoom, the ability for us to expand our personal interpersonal relationship to make it really, I don't know, a lot closer, a lot more intimate, a lot more vulnerable. I think that actually helped all of us go through it because we're going through a lot together and the company went through a lot together and we went through, you know, major amounts of, of high stress. And, you know, also we went through a period where um, everyone took a pay cut because the nonprofit was suffering and we had to do it. And the executives took a bigger pay cut than the employees. It, this was not easy. So we didn't have resources. We had minus resources and we had to work double time to just catch up. But we took that opportunity to really make sure that we cared meaningfully for all the people who were there and really reached out to make sure that there was well being, you know, that we had really good resources, mental well being kind of resources in the company and different things like that to just enhance what we had um, to ensure that people had some outlets. Very, very difficult. Um, and we expanded our safe and sick. We expanded our COVID timing. If anyone ever got um, impacted by uh, dealing with it, we gave unlimited safe and sick time. So there was a lot of things that we put in place to just give a little bit of breathing room where we normally um, wouldn't have done. So Tracy, let me know when the next pandemic happens. I'm coming to you. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. You're 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 always welcome. And and, and I, I do want to echo I I think that one of the things that we've really found is that this personal touch is so important. People have been going through like our, our team went through, you know, a, a lot during the pandemic. We had people lose relatives. We had, you know, people who who themselves were were sick, who were dealing with you know, their older parents dealing with their, their children, right? The background noise you hear here is my three-year-old screaming, right? Everybody was dealing with these unprecedented, um, you know, this heaviness in their life of having to do so many things. And so just being empathetic and being, being willing to just talk to people and reach out, that was something that, you know, as Nishat said, like, this is, it's just, it's, it's human. I mean, think about when was the last time in living memory that we all as a, as a global community went through something that was a collective experience like this. We've now we've, we've all, we've now all experienced something. There's nobody left untouched by this. And so a little bit of empathy uh, seems, seems to go a long way in this time. Uh, so I want to turn to the other topic we touched on earlier, which is sort of what your policies have been as a group in terms of hiring outside counsel and focusing on diversity. So this is for Mike and Henry. What approach have you both taken in promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion when hiring outside counsel? I guess I'll go first this time. Thanks. Um, so I, you know, um, I'm generally very direct. Um, I do use more of the stick approach than not. Uh, but it is within the context of trying to get the right information. Um, you know, I, I've asked my top 25 firms for their DEI stats last five years, promotion rates, programs, and it ended up being me and my EA doing all the collating because my operations team is swamped. Uh, when it comes to normal practice, and then I report, I wrote an email back to each of our relationship partners and the chair of the firm saying, okay, this is what's good. This is not good. This is going to get you business. This will cost you business. When it comes to big ticket items like M&A, uh, litigation, investigations, uh, the team has to be at least 50% diverse. Um, and the partners, there better be, um, at, you know, say there are two partners. There are more than two partners. We have an issue anyway. Um, 
it, one of them has to be diverse. I need to know where the money's going. I don't want like to have like diverse partners and then all of a sudden the money's kind of being back channeled into somebody I didn't, I've never met before, but I've also tried to be less, I'm trying to think of an appropriate word, stick-like. Uh, so like when, like a, a transaction's done or an investigation's done, if there are associates, I want to meet the associates if, and if I'm involved, if associates do well, I mean, I have written the chair of the firm saying, blah and blah, right, without naming names, have done well. They're an asset to your firm. I hope to see them continue to rise through the firm. You know, my business with your firm is somewhat contingent upon that. <laughs> um, so it's a little, it's also kind of a stick, but at least it's a stick with a little bit of propping up people, try to <laughs> bring out people. So Henry? Yeah, so um, I, I don't carry a big stick like Mike. Um, um, I have to say um, our our company um, on the whole um, is is extremely diverse. Uh, and my department here is, I forget, I think maybe it was um, Tracy, you may mentioned it. Um, we have you know, Caucasian male is actually the minority um, in, in our department. Uh, over 50% of our department is uh, women um, and very diverse across the board. Uh, and when it comes to outside counsel, fortunately for us, we've always had a diverse team. But, um, but given you know, the issues that are facing us as a society, um, the team has that, and, and, you know, the team, myself, we, we said, hey, we should have something more formal, like, like a bat, right? Um, we should dig in a little bit deeper and find out what are our vendors doing. And, and you know, coincidentally, and fortunately, other departments are doing the same thing. You know, we have global suppliers and uh, communication and manufacturing. And, and so now the legal department, we are um, authoring the company's uh, at least draft form, right? Because we've got to collaborate. Remember, we've got to influence, right? And uh, we're going to take pen to paper on drafting something very formal in terms of what um, uh, we would want our stick to look like. And, and one of the things, again, this is in draft form. Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's work product, it's not privileged. And so I'm happy to share with you guys. And, and it's nothing novel, in fact, I, I think, uh, but it is interesting and that is requiring our vendors to, um, to provide DNI training, right, for their workforce. And making sure it's almost like FCPA compliance. You want your vendors to go through FCPA training. Now we're requiring them to go through DNI training. Uh, so I'm I'm really excited about that type because education and culture to me, I think it's probably more lasting than just you know quarter to quarter fiscal reports. So um, so yeah, those, those those are my thoughts. I could add one more thing, and that was I, I like that idea of training. Is I think for the law firm people out there, particularly the partners, the backdrop is one of my jobs is to reduce outside spend as much as possible. So it is, the more you reduce it, the less leverage you have. Um, so that's just, that is the other force at work. So here's a question because we're running short on time. I wanna open up to everyone. You know, a lot of law firms took very public positions on diversity and made commitments after the Black Lives Matter movement. Do you consider, you know, a firm's commitment to racial and social justice in your hiring decisions and you know, if so, what do you consider? It's a conversation that I have with law firms, but um, but there has to be something that's measurable, and they have to be accountable to change. If I'm having the same conversation three years later, it's not a good thing, <laughs> and there will absolutely be impact. And so, you know, I know that a lot of the panelists today have had the conversations with the law firms where you get the glossy and you get a good conversation, but ultimately there's no difference either in the representation of the firms, you know, um, you know promotion of folks to leadership of the, the law firms, or you don't see it in, in the billable hours kind of beside some, an increase one way or another. And so I think the, the biggest thing is, and LCLD does a great job of this, is, is that accountability piece there has to be demonstrable change. Yeah, right. to, Hannah's, to Hannah's point, all, all I wanted to jump in and say to Hannah's point very quickly, 
is I, I find it useful and I think we probably all collectively do. It's good to listen to, to what they say. It's good to hear them out. It's good to listen to what their plans is plans are. Um, but ultimately you have to watch their hands and, and you can listen to what they say. They can say wonderful things. At the end of the day, you have to watch their hands. What are they doing? And that's really where the rubber meets the road. And I guess with that metaphor, what's interesting is I, I find a lot of the, um, the polished speaking is the thing that I actually like the least. I, I'd rather them talk about how hard it is and explain from a humble perspective what they're trying to do. Because I find that, you know, I think in our industry, lawyers easily fall into the arrogant category because that's how they kind of show up. And they're like, look what I've done of $25 million of this, that, the other thing. And when you look at them as people and you really try to examine what they've done on the day-to-day -day of dealing with diversity or even being a creative collaborative partner, um, I look for humility and I look for true partnership and that they may not know all the answers, but they're working hard at it. And to me, that shows some actual real progress. Otherwise, they're just calling it out and acting as if they, they've done it already, um, which is typically not the case when you dig in and check their hands, as Tracy, as you said. Hey, hey Nisha, I really like your arrogant voice. Oh, <laughs> that's very effective. So, you know, talking, talking about the arrogant voice and talking about uh, outside counsel, everyone's favorite topic to, to bash on. Can any of you give us an instance where, you know, outside counsel pitch diversity ineffectively to you? All right, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, not not um, in my role as an in-house attorney, but I won't say which firm, but during my earlier days um, um, in my career, um, I was part of a pitch and um, I was a sole minority. Um, you know, you can say the token, right? Um, it, it, it was just uncomfortable. Look, bottom line is going back to what we were talking about, Mike was saying, you know, opportunities, right? Um, I got the opportunity to be in the room and I learned from it. But having um, token um, attorneys, regardless of background, purpose, whatever it is, it's just not, it's just not an effective way to do it. You know, it's just awkward. I'll follow up and I'll steal shamelessly from Tracy and Nishat um, in terms of, you know, they could say what they want, they could bring who they want, but then what's really behind it. I mean, to Nishat's point, I'd rather you just say, listen, we're trying. We're trying, we're not there. And listen, I, Aslan as a company is nowhere near where it should be. My legal department, which is probably one of the more diverse departments in the company, is still not where it should be. So it's okay to say you're not where you, should, should, you are, want to be, but don't, don't fake it. Uh, to also steal from Henry. The best people just steal from others. So I'll stop. So with our, with our limited time left, I wanna talk a little bit about the Black Lives Matter movement, about hate crimes towards APA community. Um, I'll start with Tracy. What concrete steps you know, did your company take after these events? Because I think you know, there was a lot of press around this and the quick reaction by NASCAR. Yeah, you know, um... A bit of background when I when I came on, um, you know, I, I came from a very diverse industry. The fight industry is incredibly diverse, um, you know, and is actually it's in terms of even gender diversity getting a, a whole lot better. It's come miles, right? Um, and and NASCAR does not have a reputation for being diverse at all, right? I'm sure that that is you know, and it's and it's earned over time, right? And so one of the one of the things that was really a deal breaker for me taking the job uh, was that there was a true commitment there, right? To, to Mike's point, right? That there's, that, you know, they were humble and said, we're not where we want to be, but we're, we're, we're really committed to, to moving this ball forward. And I think, you know, I think that we, you know, when, when the, um, when the tragedies in Atlanta happened back in 2020, we literally had a race scheduled the very next weekend at Atlanta Motor Speedway, a, a, a cup race, truck race, and an Xfinity race um, after those shootings took part. And as a company, we thought it was really important to use the sports platform 
as an opportunity to shed light on the, the stop AAPI hate movement, um, you know, and, and just shed light on the recent events with the platform that we had. Um, and so the first thing we did was we, we had a moment of silence um, prior to the Cup Series that weekend. That was unprecedented. That never that never been done in the sport. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we, we, we really started figuring out, I think we'd, we had, we'd started to plan and figure out like, where do we really want to be and what is our path to, to get there? And, and frankly, you know, that was a big moment in our sport and then not less than, you know, gosh, two, three months later, um, you know, I was in Talladega after we banned the Confederate flag and I was there for, for enforcement. That's, I was, I was there at the, the parking lot gate making sure that people didn't have it on their cars or on their shirts. Um, and I was, I was heartened actually by the fact that I didn't really have to have many conversations. It, it, it actually, it gave me optimism. Um, and, I, and I think in, in making the moves that NASCAR has made and, and really starting to devote more resources towards diversity. NASCAR actually has an incredibly old drive for diversity program that, that has been around for decades. That is a great pipeline for our diverse talent. Um, is our pipeline where we want it to be? No, it's, it, we, we, we have to get better. And so I think that NASCAR has really um, shown a, a commitment, at least while I've been here to, to moving the ball forward. And I, the, the, at the end of the day, there, there is a humility to it where, you know, you say our sport is not where it needs to be, but we are going to mandate that all people who are in the industry, right? Teams, pit crews, drivers, people who work at the shops are they They have to take mandatory D and I training the whole industry and the employment lawyers, you know, won't necessarily like that because we're mandating all these things that, that people do, but it's necessary. It was something that was, really important to us and and that we you know the team owners were on board with too so that's that's a requirement now for for all industry members anybody who holds a nascar license and membership has to get dni training and there's more to come but that's a, it's a start thank you I, I, we have very little time left so i want to ask this last question to everyone um given you know all of these events given a lot of the, the movement finally in the legal industry how do you see your company evolving, especially over the long term? And what do you think your long term diversity, equity, and inclusion goals are as a company? A big question to end with. <laughs> Three minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll, My I'll, God. I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> jump on this one. one. Brave, only one brave person, Henry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll jump on this one. Um, I don't think it's going to go away. I think, you know, despite my earlier concern that this is just going to be a passing moment, um, at least particularly for publicly traded company with the ESG movement, with the SEC looking at, you know, this very important, these important issues. Um, I don't think it's going to go away for our company. In fact, um, last year we formed an ESG committee at the board level. And we specifically went out and, uh, and recruited a board member whose passion uh, for ESG started back in 2005 before we even knew about ESG. And as a chair, um, so Sophie Lilius, um, she's based out of Paris, um, France. So I don't think it's going to go away. And uh, in fact, um, this week we just completed our 2020 global responsibility um, report that is going out to all the rating agencies, ISS, Glass Lewis. And, and a key component of that report is about the ENI and about metrics, something that Mike had mentioned that uh, many of the other panelists mentioned here that you, know, you got to start tracking this because otherwise it's just fluff, right? So um, again, you know, I, I have my personal concerns, but uh, but I think given where the market's going, given where society is going, given where the politics are going, um, I think, fortunately, knock on wood, I think it's going to be here for a while. And our company, um, thankfully, um, is, com is committed to it at the, at the very, very highest level of the company. Thank you so much, Henry. You're like right on time, a true litigator, and then closed us out on such a high note. I want to thank this amazing panel of speakers. Thank you all so much for making the time for this. It was really invaluable. 
I also want to thank, of course, Avani for putting this together and the wonderful in-house committee that's responsible for this. Uh, Grace Fu, who's here with us on video, and then Jennifer Can and Blossom Can, who are both here, but have their cameras turned off, but they're wonderful and they help put all of this together. So thanks again. Thanks so much, everyone. And uh, for those of you who are uh, here at King and Spalding in the offices in person, thanks for coming in person. And we'll see you at the reception shortly after. Great job moderating as well. Yeah, yeah. great job. Great job. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. I agree. Bye. Thanks, Shayla. Thanks, everyone. Bye.